Coming up on Studios America, you know the abortion case in front of the Supreme Court that's been going on. Well, we'll be joined by the woman who wrote the bill. Representative Becky Curry of Mississippi joins us today. A trans swimmer at Penn University is making waves, I <laughs> get it, with her teammates. Only LeBron James would be dumb enough to miss out on my merch discount I've got going on right now for Christmas. Use the code STU20 for stewdoesmerch.com. 20% off all the swag, including the very popular Don't Be an Idiot, Don't Be a LeBron t-shirt and other items. And it's not the government's job to regulate, well, you know, pretty much anything in my view. But social media, you know, I don't know. I mean, what are the alternatives when these big tech companies suck so hard? Let's find out as we do big tech versus families. might occasionally go on a social media app and find things that you really like. I mean, there's a lot of content out there that's enjoyable. Like, for example, a little show called Stu Does America, available everywhere you get your social media. And after going through the stuff for this segment today, maybe this should be the only thing you follow. Uh, maybe you should turn everything else off. Um, but, of course, selfishly, I'd love for you to follow us. And I think there is a lot of value of course, on following content that you enjoy and get something out of. Uh, I, you know, I have a, an account on Instagram that you can follow, Studios America, and I have an account, a private account that I use, you know, really just for, you know, f following food accounts. Now, you might know this about me. I uh, happen to be America's only conservative vegetarian. So I, one of the things I do with my little personal Instagram account is I follow a bunch of f food places that are, you know, in my area because I want to see them post food so I can just get a little bit fatter for, to do the show every day. I don't want to be a thin host. People hate thin hosts. They hate them. So what's funny about that, though, is that there's a new feature, I think it's pretty new at least, where they're recommending all these pages for you on Instagram. And of course, this has been around on social media for a long time. I don't follow a particular account, but they say, hey, I see that you follow this account and this account and this account. You'd probably like content from this person. And you just realize like how dumb these, some of these algorithms are at times. I mean, because I follow vegetarian food places, they basically think I'm a female communist. Now, you might say, wait a minute, you know, I, I watch your show every day and you kind of seem like a female communist. And I can understand that point of view. Uh, but it's funny because I really don't need to hear the communist views of uh, some lady who also happens to be a vegetarian in San Francisco. Not really, uh, not really one of my priorities. Uh, in fact, some of these, I will say, some of these algorithms that, that serve ads uh, to you are so, so bad. It's hard to even imagine. Let me give you this one. This was served to me today on my Twitter account, and I had to pull up to you just to show you how stupid some of this stuff is. It is a, an ad from the New York Times. Now, first of all, I'm not a huge fan of the New York Times, so that's number one, okay? This is the ad that it says. It says, on my first night wearing the jacket, I, only, I had only to strut a few blocks in Soho before running into a one-time hinge date. And Andre Wheeler writes of his Yeezy Gap jacket, you look rich, he said. Now, let me go through this bit by bit to just show you. I don't like the New York Times. Um, I don't live in an area that's, generally speaking, cold enough to wear jackets. Uh, I have never in my life, I've not taken one step that is part of a strut in my entire existence. Uh, walking a few blocks sounds terrible to me. I never go to Soho. I don't live anywhere near Soho. I uh, have never been on Hinge. Pretty much no one has ever wanted to date me in my entire life. I've never dated a dude. I've never dated a, du dated a dude named Andre. And in my worst nightmares, I would never think to purchase a Yeezy Gap jacket, nor do I want to look rich. Literally every single part of this ad is something that I would despise or just find generally uh, unlikable. And yet they're like, well, you know who's going to like that? Stu. He's got to get that Yeezy Gap jacket. I mean, 
at times, I go back and forth between big tech being this overarching evil enemy that's going to control all of our lives to how incompetent and terrible are these people? I mean, the New York Times spent money to serve me that. This is where we are in our society. There's been a bunch of um, testimony, uh, this, uh, most recently from the head of Instagram, talking about the effects of social media and all these big tech companies on kids and your family. And I, this is something I find to be you know, really personal and important um, because I got a couple of young kids and they're just young enough where they're not really, they, you know, they're not really going to the worst of the internet yet. Uh, but as we all know, this is uh, around the corner for every single uh, child at some point. And so you want to do your best uh, to try to control that experience for at least as long as you can. You can't control it forever. All you can do is build a foundation and hope your kids don't, uh, don't become train wrecks. It's kind of all you can do. Um, let me give you some of this uh, testimony here. Uh, one of the big things Instagram is being uh, charged with is, is this even a safe experience for kids? I will tell you, I don't think it is. Uh, but this is what Instagram had to say about it. As the head of Instagram, it's my responsibility to do all I can to keep people safe. I've been committed to that for years, and I'm going to continue to do so. Whether or not we invest more than every other company or not doesn't really matter for any individual. If any, if any individual harms themselves or has a negative experience on our platform, that's something that I take incredibly seriously. No, I mean, he was very, uh, his, he was a little verklempt, as they say, uh, with his voice there. And, I, you know, is this true? I mean, I don't think, look, people, generally speaking, of course, have some empathy, I think, for people who might have a bad experience at their place. But, you know, Instagram's made a lot of decisions, along with uh, their parent company now called Meta, uh, that don't seem to indicate that safety is the highest priority for uh, their users. In fact, the best thing they could probably do is just unplug the website and never have it come on again. That's, just, that's one idea. Throwing it out there. Uh, that might be the safest thing that they could do. Surgeon General uh, has talked about this with social media. Uh, they have a uh, something that came out. It's called Parenting uh, Youth Mental Health. Uh, protecting Youth Mental Health, the U.S. Surgeon General's advisory. Here's how it reads. We, when, not deployed, when not deployed responsibly and safely, these tools can pit us against each other, reinforce negative behaviors like bullying and inclusion, and undermine the safe and supportive environments young people need and deserve. Um, Masseri uh, was there as well talking about what he thinks would be a good solution for all of this. Watch. We believe there should be an industry body that will determine the best practices when it comes to what I think are the three most important questions with regards to youth safety. How to verify age, how to build age-appropriate experiences, and how to build parental controls. The body should receive input from civil society, from parents, and from regulators. The standards need to be high, and the protections universal. I believe that companies like ours should have to earn some of their Section 230 protections by adhering to those standards. <laughs> you can see the pressure on these guys because uh, now they're basically, yeah, we should let me give you all the rules you should put on us so we can continue to make all of our cash. Um, there was a back and forth as well about um, Instagram kids. Now, Instagram kids was this idea. That, you know, there's like a YouTube kids. If you have kids that are young, you, you may use some of these services. Uh, there's YouTube kids that's supposed to, you know, basically filter out the bad stuff. So kids can watch YouTube without being recommend, you know, recommended like terrible, terrible things that they shouldn't be seeing. Um, rich, you know, and I think there's a, there's a risk here uh, when we talk about politicians grilling uh, social media executives. And I want to be completely honest about this. I, I am really concerned about these issues when it comes to social media and big tech. I also don't particularly like uh, this sort of theater that we put together where we have senators come up and I'm going to finger wag and I'm going to tell you that you're really bad and I'm going to do lots of things because I think it's important. Like some of it to me just strikes me so inauthentic. Now, Richard Bl Blumenthal is famously inauthentic. Uh, here he is, though, talking about Instagram kids. Uh, will you commit to make the pause on Instagram kids permanent? In other words, stop developing site for an app for children under 13. Senator, the idea of building a version of Instagram for 10 to 12 year olds was trying to solve a problem. The idea being that we know that 10 to 12 year olds are online, they want to use platforms like Instagram, and it's difficult for companies like ours 
to verify age for those that are so young they don't yet have an ID. The hope was to always, or the plan was to always make sure that no child between 10 and 12 had access to any version of Instagram, even one that was designed for them without their parents' consent. So, and like, look, I, I have some sympathy for that argument, honestly. I mean, you're right, of course, people get online and it would be great. I mean, YouTube Kids is considerably better than regular YouTube for kids. <laughs> you know, they take away most of the bad stuff. It's not perfect, but it's better. Uh, obviously, best case scenario, you don't have your kids on YouTube at all. But, you know, they tend to find their way there and it's difficult to control. And that's kind of what I want to get into here in a minute. Um, but... What Instagram seems to do, particularly with young people and not even just kids, but teenagers and even young adults, is to continually drive them to terrible, terrible content that will keep them on the service longer and longer. And that's the problem here is the is the uh, the priorities of these companies don't seem to have anything to do with safety or health. It has to do with keeping people's eyeballs on these screens until the end of time. Here is uh, Blumenthal uh, going on about um, some of the research the Senate was doing here in preparation for this particular uh, hearing. We have a teen account with all the protections on, the filters. We searched, quote, slit wrists, and the results I don't feel I can describe in this hearing room. They are so graphic. That's within the past couple of days. I described to you an account that looked at, in effect, eating disorders and attracted the same deluge of self-harm and anorexia coaches. Uh, if at the top of your resume is the term anorexia coach, you, you're doing life wrong. Just in case you were wondering, you need to kind of you need to kind of change directions in your existence. Um, but it's true, this stuff is all out there and being targeted at young people. A lot of times, not even if you don't search directly for it, you're able to make your way to this content. Um, TikTok had a, a story come out about them where they went in and, and, and um, analyzed their algorithm. And of course, most of these algorithms, as we point out, some of them are really stupid. Uh, some of them uh, do the basics, right? Like if you like, um, I, another thing Instagram thinks about me is that I'm Canadian. Now, as you may know, I'm a Canadian sports hero, Canadian sports celebrity. Um, but I also like the Toronto Blue Jays. And uh, because I like Blue Jays content, they're constantly serving me things about Canada. Now, I, have, I don't go to Canada often. I like the Blue Jays. That's it. Um, so some of it's just that. OK, this guy likes the Blue Jays. He probably liked this restaurant in Toronto. OK, I get it. I mean, you know, OK, fine. Um, but it goes further than that. Like, for example, on TikTok, which I thankfully do not have account, an account on, um, they will recommend videos and they get obviously good enough to recognize what kind of content you that you want. But instead of serving that content to you right away over and over and over again, because that's what you're looking for, they will intentionally serve up content that you're not looking for, that they think you might also like uh, to before they give you the stuff that you do want. Why? Why would you do that? Well, they figure if you keep they keep serving you the same types of videos, you're going to get bored and turn it off. And if they give you six videos in a row, you don't really like that much. The seventh one they know you're going to like. Well, you can you get in a pattern of, of scrolling and scrolling and scrolling more often. And you're on the site for seven videos instead of one. And that's the problem here. This is an economy. There's a, a, a podcast out today um, from The New York Times, The Daily, that uh, talks about a site where people are encouraged to commit suicide, to figure out how to do it, what methods to do it. Uh, and they had to go track down, you know, through all sorts of hacked documents and everything else just to find out who owns the thing. There's so much stuff out there. Um, Blumenthal went back at um, uh, the uh, head of Instagram and tried to just lock him down on uh, where we are in this back and forth between big tech and big government. And I keep bringing up Blumenthal for a reason here. Watch this quote. I believe that the time for self-policing and self-regulation is over. Some of the big tech companies have said, trust us. That seems to be what Instagram is saying in your testimony. But self-policing depends on trust. The trust is gone. 
Now, you might expect a Democratic government official to be promoting the idea that they're going to control a big company. I mean, that's not exactly out of the realm of the normal day of Richard Blumenthal. But let me also give you Marsha Blackburn, who is not someone who's looking to control uh, every company that she can get her hands on. Look what she said. Mr. Masseri, we are telling you children have inflicted self-harm. They are getting information that is destroying their young lives. And we are asking you, have some empathy and take some responsibility. And it seems as if you just can't get on that path. So we are going to continue to work on this issue. You see this even from conservatives who don't necessarily uh, immediately react with government control every time there's a problem. They're seeing this, they're seeing this problem, and now really both sides are coming at big tech to try to uh, control them um, and, and, and make sure that they're doing these things because they just don't seem interested in doing it. And I will say, you know, um, my, you know, look, my kids are not on social media. I hope they never, maybe when they're 45, will allow it. Um, but they're not on social media and I don't plan on them being social media, but it's not even just social media. You know, they're playing a, a, a uh, a harmless kids game on, on, on our phone for a few minutes and the ads pop up and the ads are bizarre and disturbing content sometimes. Uh, you, they're watching, you know, they go on YouTube and they're watching a craft video and then it recommends something, you know, maybe it's not even just harmful and terrible, but just vapid and awful nonsense. And you just get to the point where you think, you know, both sides are now coming after you. Do you see this, Big Tech? Do you see this? Both sides are coming to a point of agreement, a, a rare moment of bipartisanship where they think you're so terrible, they're going to do something. And when, as a person who's very skeptical of government influence in things uh, like this, or really almost everything, it's really difficult to understand why they make it so hard on parents. You know, like, these are devices that, parents purchase, that parents set up, that parents pay for the internet, they pay for the devices, they pay for these services, and it's almost impossible to control the content that goes on to them. You know, I mean, I have spent the better part of the last couple of years trying to get every, all this crap set up just so, I mean, I don't, I mean, I understand eventually the kids are going to see things that I don't want them to see, but like, I'm not trying to, to hasten that whole process. I'd like to control it for as long as possible. And yes, I can take my kids completely off of them, and sometimes I do. Um, but, you know, at some point, uh, I mean, a lot of their schoolwork is now done on these things. So it's almost impossible to completely eliminate it. And why there isn't an easy way uh, to control this from a parental perspective, I don't know. I've signed up for services. I've had people talk me through stuff. I've had tech people look at it. You go through all this and it's almost impossible. And I fear for my, I mean, this is almost a just completely selfish point here, but I know this is coming with my kids in a few years and it's going to be a nightmare. And I don't know how I'm going to control it. And like, this is the point, like Adam Masseri uh, said, um, you know, there should be an industry body that determines the best practices. The body should receive input from society, regulators. The standards need to be high. And I believe companies like ours should have to earn some of their Section 230 protections by adhering to those standards, such as uh, verifying age. And, you know, that might be part of the, of the whole package. But, like, if you, like, we're the parents. We're the people who are going to allow um, younger kids to be able to look at these devices or not. So why don't you make it easy for us? Make it e give me a freaking button that I can just press and make sure my kid's not looking at some terrible content like they were describing in these last uh, couple of he uh, hearings. There's no reason for that. And I keep thinking to myself, what is the purpose here? Why isn't it easy? And the only thing I can come up with is they don't want it to be easy. I understand that it's impossible to filter every piece of content. I get that something can slip through here and there, but it's not, that's not the problem here. The problem is these, there are very few options to be able to control the content for your kids. You have to buy outside services and, and go through hours and hours of connecting them to all the different devices and apps and, and all of that. 
And then it still doesn't seem to work. It's still overwhelming. And unless you're a freaking tech genius, you can't get any of it done. Why is this hard? These the people in the Senate, people that are Republicans and people who are Democrats are going to continue to come at these companies and they're going to try to do something to solve this problem. Not because government's so great, not because they probably even care about this, but because they know their constituents want it stopped. So why not make it easy? You spend so much time making sure you can recommend me the Gap Yeezy jacket, whatever the hell that is, so I can look rich in Soho with my mail date. You, can, you go through all that, that process uh, to, to serve up content that you, you think people supposedly like. Well, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't understand it. Why can't it just be nice and easy for parents to be able to control the experience for their kids? This is not asking too much. And I think the answer is they find it more valuable to keep their kids on these services. They know they're growing little soldiers for their stupid apps. And they know long term they're going to get people on these things and they're never going to leave. And that means more money in their pockets. And, I, you know, look, whether you think it's right or wrong, if they continue to go down this road and do not make this easy for parents to be able to control the experience for their own kids at least, what's going to wind up happening is the government is going to step in, whether you like it or not, whether you think it's the right approach or not. If they don't do it, the government's going to wind up cracking down. And I hope these, uh, I hope these apps are ready for that because it's, it's going to come and it's going to come hard because the rest, thunderous applause is going to be the, uh, the background noise of these sorts of, uh, of, uh, of regulations. And you know the, these companies, they've had a great benefit of, uh, of a free market, which the internet largely is, but they're gonna wind up, whether I like it or not, uh, getting pushed around by the government and watch all of the, the, the creative freedom and the, the money printing machine freedom they've had over the past 10 years go away. So, if you happen to be a giant tech CEO watching this program, do something good for once. Back in a second. If you happen to be freaked out about the government's rampant spending and skyrocketing inflation, which, by the way, Janet Yellen announced just the other day, we probably shouldn't use the term transitory anymore. Ah, the term transitory the whole time. Guess what? It was transitory. Uh, it's time to protect your savings, uh, diversify your savings into physical gold and silver with Birch Gold Group. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews, thousands of satisfied customers. Right now, thanks to a little-known section of the IRS tax code, you can legally move your IRA or 401k into precious metals with no tax implications or penalties. To get started on protecting your savings with, uh, uh, with gold uh, in a tax-sheltered account, you can request a free info kit from Birch Gold by texting the word STU to 989898. It's a comprehensive 20-page kit, uh, reveals how gold and silver can help protect your savings, how you can move more uh, of your, uh, maybe some of your IRA or 401k out of some volatile stocks or wherever you might have them, and move them into a precious metals IRA. There's zero cost, zero obligation to get the info, so why wait? Check it out. Text the word STU to 989898. Get the free info on gold now from Birch Gold Group by going uh, to your phone, texting Stu 989898. You may not know the name Becky Curry, uh, but she is, may, she may be responsible for one of the most important things that have happened in the United States in a really long time. She's a four-term House uh, representative in the uh, M M Mississippi legislature and author of the Newsweek opinion piece, I authored Mississippi's abortion bill. Here's why. I'll make sure to tweet out a link to that article shortly at Studios America. Uh, representative, thank you for taking the time to come on the program. Thank you for having me. One of the interesting things, I want to get into the bill and why you wrote it, but one of the interesting things I thought that came out of the oral arguments w and the reaction to it was uh, this sense that these male Supreme Court justices shouldn't be mansplaining abortion to women. And I thought it was kind of interesting that the bill was written by you, a woman who uh, who seemingly has a completely different view than everybody on Twitter. 
How did you come to the idea to come up with this bill and why did you do it? Well, uh, I wrote this bill with um, a lawyer friend of mine and, you know, we did a lot of research and I'm a registered nurse and I worked in labor and delivery for a long, long time. And I remember, um, you know, unfortunately for some women that lost their babies, um, those babies would fight to live. And it was very disheartening. You know, it it was uh, trauma for the mother. She lost her child. But then, you know, we had to um, sit there for a long time while that baby uh, struggled to live. And this is back in the early 80s when technology wasn't anything like today. And so it just was the right time. We did a a 20-week bill several years earlier. But when we started working on the 15-week bill, I just always knew that there was something special for this bill and that, you know, I I don't want to sound like uh, one of those people, but I always felt it was always going to go all the way. Mm-hmm. So why why 15 weeks? Uh, there are other, you know, there's a Texas bill, obviously, they've talked about six weeks. There's many in the country at 20 weeks. Why did you select 15 weeks? Well, it's three and a half months pregnant, and I think it's time enough for anybody to decide if they're going to continue to carry their child. Uh, and, you know, I, I am uh, I believe that Life begins at conception, but, you know, I just never believed that I would be able to um, send that bill to the Supreme Court and overturn this completely. So 15 weeks seemed like a very common sense bill, three and a half months pregnant. You know, the baby feels pain and the the abortion uh, procedure is very traumatic at this point. It, the baby is chopped into pieces and, and uh, you know, here we are with someone who feels pain, and I just felt like that should be the cutoff. So it was very easy for me to do that. At this point in life, that baby sucks his thumb, feels pain, can taste what the mother has eaten, and uh, all of its major organs are there. So I just believe that it's time, if you're going to make that decision, I think if you're struggling to make that decision, um, that three and a half months is plenty of time to do that. Does it surprise you at all that this issue of all issues has become such a, a, a divisive one? I mean, it seems like everybody who, ha- you know, a, a baby's born, everyone's excited about it. Everyone goes and, and, and you know, loves on mom and dad and, and supports them. And everyone knows that the baby's adorable and all the things that we do to celebrate birth. It seems shocking to me that this is the one issue that the left continually wants. It's the hill they want to die on constantly. Do you have any idea why that is? Well, I do think that it is um, just an absurd thing, you know, because I don't know anybody that wants to kill a baby. And I especially do not know anybody who wants to kill a Uh, late term or have a late term abortion, you know, but we do need to celebrate life. And and here in Mississippi, let me also say that we're uh, coming into an upcoming session in January, and we're going to be passing a lot of bills that are going to support the mother. You know, we we don't want to say, okay, well, you have to make this decision by three and a half months, but then we're not going to help you after that. So, you know, we are doing a lot of things in support of women uh, in the upcoming session. But why the Democrats hold on to to this, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. You know, we wouldn't do it to puppies. You know, we wouldn't do it to a lot of things, but we will do it to to babies. And, you know, I don't think that America wants to be in the same category as North Korea and China, which is where we are right now. Yeah, you, you write that in, the, in your column for Newsweek, uh, talking about the seven nations on Earth, only seven on Earth that allow abortion on demand after 20 weeks. We, we spent a good amount of show uh, last week going through the laws of Europe that's supposed to be such a progressive continent. And all of their laws are more restrictive than even our, some of our most conservative uh, states here in the United States. Um, I, I mean, is that part of the motivation to make sure we're not in the category of a, a place like North Korea? Well, my motivation is to save babies' lives. And, and you know, with this bill, if it it, if it is taken as written, we will save a lot of babies' lives. And I, and I have to tell you something, as a nurse, uh, we will save a lot of mothers' lives as well. 
you know, I have treated uh, a lot of women who have serious infections after abortion, uh, hemorrhage, sometimes even have to have a, a, a hysterectomy because they can't stop bleeding. So, you know, there there's ways to look at this all around. I believe it's a, about the health of the mother and the child. So, you know, if they don't take this at 15 weeks, like we in is in the bill, my hopes are that they give um, the state's rights back. That should have never been taken from us. There's nothing in the Constitution that should have allowed this to be taken from states. And Mississippi, this bill was passed, a bipartisan bill, and uh, and we are a pro-life state. And, you know, I believe that the states need to ha not have this right taken away from them. I, you know, I challenge anybody to find where it is in the Constitution that you can have an abortion up until uh, time of birth. I just I just don't uh, believe it's there. And we've let nine people sit there and make this rule. And it, it's just time for it to end. Mm. Um, one of the arguments they made in front of the Supreme Court, and they've made this over the years many times when it comes to uh, abortion, is that it's actually better for the mom to have an abortion for her own personal safety than it is for the mom to actually give birth. Uh, you're a nurse. What do you make of that argument? Well, I, I think it's ludicrous. You know, I, I know very uh, few people that, that are not depressed after having an abortion. I have treated people. I have friends that have had abortions, and I, I know no one that doesn't regret it. And unfortunately, it can lead to other problems um, with, of depression. And and uh, so we, we if we're, we really want to help women, we want, want to make sure that they are able to make a decision. And, and, and like I said, at three and a half months, I think it's it's time you can feel the baby move, you know, all, all of the organs, so forth, all the things we've said. We want to make sure that they're given good information and we want to be there afterwards to support them with whatever decision they make. I think a part of this, uh, Representative, is is the left kind of comes at the conservative uh, line of thought with this predetermined belief that it's uh, that they want to hurt women, that they're that, that all of our policies are policies that are uh, damaging to women. We don't care about them and all these kind of crazy things. You mentioned that you're 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 going to be doing stuff to help uh, women who decide to make, I, I believe, the correct choice and and, and save the baby's life. Um, we know about the safe harbor uh, laws that were already discussed in the Supreme Court. What else can states do to make this an easier choice for women? Well, one of the things we're doing, and, and we have several bills coming up in January, is we're going to start giving more money to children's advocacy centers. You know, we're going to have some, some babies that are, are not going to be wanted. We're going to make adoption very easy in Mississippi, not that we are going to just uh, make let everybody um, adopt a precious baby, but we're going to make things better. We're going to make sure that TANF funds are, are available and they're not so hard to get. We're, we're just going to make sure that whatever child care, all of these things, we have got to step up to the plate and make sure that these babies are going to be taken care of and we're going to help these mothers take care of them. Now, uh, we want to make sure that they're able to get a good job. We equal pay for women. There's a, so many bills that are coming up in our next session that we want to make sure that we're able to help these mothers take care of these babies and we want to be there for them. We don't want to just say, okay, we made this law, see you later. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just not going to work that way in Mississippi and, and I'm going to fight just as hard to take care of these moms and, and babies that I did for this law. Let me give you. Let me get go to this last one here with you. And I don't, I don't know. Maybe you're in the business of, of legislation, and you, you know maybe this stuff doesn't hit you the same way. But best case scenario here, you're talking about a bill that you know, this this may play out in a way that saves millions of lives. Have you stopped and thought about your place in all of this? This could be a historic moment in our country's history, and it could affect millions and millions of people. Well, you know, when they, I was at work the day they told me that it was, they had taken up the case, and, and my phone was blowing up, and, 
you know, I'm, I guess I'm just, uh, it hasn't sunk in. Um, I went up to D.C. and stood out in front of the Supreme Court uh, the day of the hearings. And, um, you know, I, I kind of suck in a little bit then. And, uh, you know, I have... Um, you know, until they make that ruling, I, I, I'm not quite sure uh, this, you know, little woman from uh, Brookhaven, Mississippi wrote this bill and it may change lives in, in America. And I would be proud. I would be proud author of this bill that's able to save millions of babies' lives. Mm. Representative Becky Curry, uh, be sure to head to uh, my Twitter uh, account or hers as well. We'll make sure the op-ed from Newsweek gets out there. It's called, I authored, uh, I authored Mississippi's abortion bill. Here's why. You can send it to every single person who says that the Supreme Court was mansplaining to women about the abortion bill. A woman wrote the bill. It'd be an important detail for people to know. Uh, Representative, thank you so much for doing this, and thank you for coming on the program, and thank you for the work you've done on this. Thank you, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <music> Using the Internet without ExpressVPN is insane. Uh, it's like leaving your keys in the car while you run into a gas station for a snack and having the window down and the car's unlocked. Now, maybe you come back and it's still there. There's nice people around. Maybe they don't steal your car. But what if you come back to see your car driving off into the distance? Every time you connect an unencrypted network, any hacker on the same network can access uh, your personal data. They know what they're doing on this stuff. I don't know how to defend myself. I let ExpressVPN do that for me. They create a, sec a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the Internet. Hackers can't steal your sensitive data. Um, you know, look. It would take a hacker uh, with a supercomputer like a billion years, like literally a billion years to get past ExpressVPN's encryption. They don't have a billion years. You don't have a billion years. Just be safe while you're out there on the wild west of the Internet. It's easy to use. You can fire up the app, click one button to get protected. Plus, it works on all devices, iPhones, laptops, uh, tablets, uh, Android, whatever you got. Uh, you can be secure on the go. Secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash stew, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash stew. You can get an extra three months free if you go to that address, expressvpn.com slash stew. So Leah Thomas is a pretty good swimmer. Uh, she is breaking all sorts of records. Of course, she started her career uh, at uh, Penn University, Penn, uh, as uh, a dude. So OutKick has an exclusive interview with one of her teammates who uh, started as a woman and is still a woman. Um, and, you know, the, the records have been shocking. Um, the, 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 500, the Ivy League 500 freestyle record uh, was broken. Saturday, Thomas uh, met the nation's best time in the 200 freestyle, destroyed pool, meet, and pen program records. In the 1650 freestyle um, final, Thomas didn't just win and set a new program pool and meet records. It was a total annihilation, uh, 38 seconds ahead of the nearest competitor. This is from one of her um, teammates. She says, Pretty much everyone individually has spoken to our coaches about not liking this. Our coach just really likes winning. He's like most coaches. I think secretly everyone knows it's the wrong thing to do, the female Penn swimmer said during a phone interview. When the whole team is together, we have to be like, oh, my gosh, go, Leah. That's great. You're amazing. It's very fake. Um, now, this is amazing. Because it just shows how ridiculous this is. On paper, if Leah Thomas, the transgendered athlete here, gets back down to the times, uh, she's a couple seconds behind the times that she was swimming at when she was swimming as a male. But if she gets back down to those times, which seems to be coming here, um, those numbers are female world records. World records. Faster than all the times uh, Katie Ledecky went in college, faster than any other Olympian you can think of. His times in these three events are female world records. Only two seconds behind the female world record right now. And this is just like, I mean, this is what's happening to you know, female athletes all over the place. They, they feel like they can't say anything. But until they do, this is just going to continue to happen. Back in a second. Some things we can all agree on, like the value of a good night's sleep. That's why no gift will be more appreciated this holiday season than Cozy Earth's sheets, pajamas, or loungewear. Cozy Earth's bedding and loungewear are temperature-regulating so that you will sleep comfortably all year round. And the temperature in bed is so 
so utterly important. Thousands of five-star reviews. Uh, Cozy Earth sheets have become the bedding of choice for interior designers, celebrities, even massive celebrities like the one you happen to be listening to right now. Cozy Earth is so confident you'll love their products that you can try anything risk-free with their 100-night trial. I mean, 100 nights. You better be able to figure it out by then. Okay, get in it. If you like it, you're going to keep it. If on night 99, if you really feel like you don't like it anymore, I guess you can send it back, but that's not going to happen. Right now, you can save 35% on Cozy Earth bedding and loungewear. Start your ha- uh, holiday shopping now and go to CozyEarth.com. Enter the promo code STU and save 35%. 35% off at CozyEarth.com. Promo code STU. CozyEarth.com. Promo code STU. Just over a week away from the Power Hour, go to StuDoesPowerHour.com. Uh, if you don't know what this is, we do a, a shot of beer per minute for an hour with a great uh, cast of characters, including Chad Prather, um, half Asian lawyer Bill Richmond, my wife Lisa Page, Sarah Gonzalez, Jason Buttrill, so many uh, it's on, uh, that are uh, chipping in on this one. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's really ridiculous, and it's a great way to kick off Christmas vacation. Um, come check it out. And if you go to studospowerhour.com and you click on the RSVP uh, for the event, that will basically get you uh, uh, hooked up to, uh, we're going to be giving away some prizes to the people who are um, uh, a select group of people who RSVP. Get uh, involved and be one of those people who could win. Uh, check it out, stewdoespowerhour.com. We've got the merch there. We've got everything there. Uh, check it out. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, let me give you, um, let's see. Let me give you this first. Uh, we have a... Uh, we have this uh, right here, by the way, studosmerch.com. Uh, it's not a riot. It's a mostly peaceful tree lighting. And that was something we did last year. It was a thing we came up with last year. However, it came true in New York. We mentioned it the other day. They lit a Christmas tree on fire because that's where we are. Um, the Fox Christmas tree arson suspect, which they I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of cameras out there. They pretty much know who it was. Uh, he was released without bail. Uh, because this is the way our society handles these things now, uh, which is completely nuts. I mean, it's just not not the way we should do it. Uh, these the bail issues here are really affecting our country. And, you know, one of the easiest ways to get crime out from your community is to take people who can continually commit crimes out of the community. So they can't affect people. They go behind bars. Well, we don't want to do that anymore. That's apparently not what we want to do uh, because of that approach. Uh, largely, we have seen uh, 12 cities now. 12 cities uh, have broken annual homicide records. Quick rundown. Austin, Texas, by the way, uh, broke it. Last time I was in Austin, Texas, I was in the area of a mass shooting uh, just 24 hours before it happened. So uh, that was fantastic. Albuquerque, Tucson, Louisville, uh, Columbus, Baton Rouge, Philly, Rochester, Toledo, Indianapolis, Portland, St. Paul. Tons of these uh, places all have all-time records in homicide. So, you know, this is going well. This, this whole experiment is going really, really well, and all of these ideas are working really, really well so far. I just hope, I hope Joe Biden does a little bit more just to help us out down the road to terror and tragedy and horror. Back in a second. If you have a second, subscribe to the podcast, rate and review it. Um, You know, five stars is the appropriate number of stars. I really like this guy's username for an audio podcast review. I watch it on YouTube usually. What's the (laughs) the username? Uh, Being a vegetarian almost cost you a star. You've been warned. (laughs) Fair enough. Fair enough. You can also watch the show on YouTube if you'd like. uh, And you can comment live during the show. No Studamus predicted the Cuomo debacle. I'm rethinking my faith. Uh, Fair enough. Uh, It's true. Uh, Well, you were all there with me. Uh, Good to see Dana Lash again. I was wondering what she was working on. Great guest. And congrats on the 400th episode. Yes, right. We passed 400 episodes. Maybe we'll celebrate that a little bit on studospowerhour.com next week. We'll see you tomorrow.